and welcome to the Codex Cantina, where my name is Una. And I am the Pale Man, because <laughs> I never go out in the sun. <laughs> and I'm going to be haunting your dreams, Una. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. So this is our Halloween series. Uh, you can see that I'm traveling this week, so just kind of recording here just on my phone in the hotel room. Totally normal thing here to do. <laughs> It's great. I love it. And the whole story happens in a motel. How creepy is that? Which which room are you in? Which room are you in? I'm, I don't want to because <laughs> that's kind of scary, actually, now that you bring that up. Now I'm not going to be able to sleep. Great. We're are talking. You, are you 101? Are you in room 101? No, no, no. <laughs> We're talking The Pale Man by Julius Long this week. And uh, I, think, I think you bring up a, a really interesting point about it being disturbing, I guess, on some level. Uh, let's say this there, there's no way you read this and you're not like oh like there's some edgar Allan poe notes here yeah i love this little story it's great as i think an introductory story of how learning that the scene can really set your story on fire i imagine that there's something to be said about how the setting like the man being isolated in a motel where he's by himself he's supposed to be on this summer rest Right, which again is setting up some of like the psychological unease, represents the character's inner psyche. Right, he's isolated and of himself. He mentions how he's lonely. He longs to connect with the stranger, the pale man, for some reason. He's obsessed with the pale man. Why? Is, is it is it just to connect? Is it, is it that lost humanity that he's searching for? I think that it's something that when you don't know, it's that mystery that gets a lot of us it's why cliffhangers work right we we always want to know something and when we're not presented immediately with solutions or ideas that innate human hunger to have the answer i think comes out in us and i think for our narrator that's kind of what's happening is there's this guy that is seemingly to be um what's the word i'm looking for uh aloof and he is not being very cordial or interactive with him. And maybe this is a guy that's used to everybody kind of liking him. And he doesn't like this air of mystery. And he, he wants to figure out who he is. And I can understand that. And especially in this isolated setting, he's thinking, well, this could be my only opportunity to having a friend. And we can kind of get into that in the story of why is he isolated? Why does he feel isolated? And ultimately, you know, what is your interpretation of why is he isolated? So if we take it at story value, the what is it? The president of the university sends him away. He's an assistant re teacher, assistant researcher, and is put on rest. You know, back in the time where you had more rest periods, like your, the thought was rest would cure all kind of thing. It's it's a little bit beyond that in terms of the period that it's written. So it depends on when you look at it in the universe. But the the idea is that he's sent away by society. And then he longs for this connection is kind of how I read it. And you see how in the beginning, it's something very normal. Of, there's that pale man in room 212. There's something odd about that man in 212. There's something going on. But then he moves to 211, and then to 210, and then to 29. And then, oh, he can't go any further because if he's going up by ones, there's that old lady who's the only other permanent resident besides, you know, me, the old lady, and this man. Uh, that that he can't possibly get past, right? Like that's that's the premise of this: is that there's something odd about the man moving room by room. Yeah, and the setting of him being isolated by society, and then he gets isolated, double down when he gets to this remote motel in this supposed to be quaint little town. It has some of that feel of small town uh, vibes to it, to where. He's the outsider. He comes in, and they don't accept him. He's the big city guy. We're small, simple folks. We don't want you here. And he's rejected by them. So he's sent away and then rejected. And so he is all alone, and he's longing for that human connection. And here he's looking at the situation saying, oh, maybe the guy in 212 is having a similar experience. Maybe there's a connection for us, and we can be buddies. And what I found striking is, why didn't he go to two, the lady in 208? Why why does he gravitate instantly to 212? I think that's your first clue of truly what's going on in the story. Do you think he's afraid of, of dying of old age and that the old woman is closest to it, so therefore he's 
avoiding her. And instead you have the man who, this is, this is my interpretation, right? So you can have a totally different one. But he starts in 212, which if we look at a clock, 24 hours in a day, but you have the military time, right? Well, if you just take it by a.m., p.m., you have 212 rotations, right? 212 rotations, and that's the room that he starts in. And just like a clock, clock's ticking away at him, just like how life is clicking away. And at the end of your life, you're at, you're at death, 208, right? And that's what he's trying to avoid is, is to be avoiding almost kind of like the end of the life is how I took it. Yeah, I think that's a great interpretation of the story because as the time of your life is counting down, what is the man in 212 doing? He's moving down the timer and then he has to skip 208 because the lady dies and he goes into 207 and then et cetera, all the way down. And then at the end of the story, the old man, uh, the narrator himself realizes that the, the, the mystery man moving down the time is death. Uh, and that he's dying, and that he's basically been sent away to die, which is kind of heartbreaking. And that's the ending that I interpret it as, is that this is death come to collect his soul. Well, I wouldn't say he skipped over the lady. Like, going by to me, by going through that room, like, that's death greeting you, right? Like, it takes you in the same way. And, and I think that this is what made the man kind of lose his mind. That's why he fell asleep, and he just, like, woke up prone, and he started having to like, like stay in bed for a couple of days at a time. And all of a sudden, three hours had passed. Three, the, old, the, uh, the, the pale man had skipped three rooms, almost as if time had gotten away from him. And like you said, there's like that line kind of like at the end. I, I'd be curious to hear why you thought it was death. I, I came to that same conclusion. But he says, when he comes, I shall at least be able to return his smile of grim recognition. And the very subtle usage of the word grim, right? Grim Reaper and such like that. That's what made me kind of think of it as the clock is ticking for your life. The, oh, the death is coming for you. The Grim Reaper is coming for you. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. And when it passes through your time, right? When it passes through room 208, the old lady died. So therefore, when it goes through 201, that's, that's going to be the narrator's time to go. Is kind of what he's kind of mentally processing. Yeah, I, I think there's so many stories about love and life. And I think that one of the things that we all have to accept is that we're all going to die. And there are so many stories and interpretations of what happens when you die. We quote, all die alone, or truly do we? What happens in that last moment that it's one second between life and death, that last breath, and then you're gone? What happens to you? Nobody truly knows. And I think putting a embodiment to death helps people cope with it. And I think that's what the narrator, the protagonist of our story is doing, is trying to cope with his own mortality. And as he's, the, the numbers are counting down throughout the story, and then he goes through this kind of delusional time period, he realized, he, he finally had a, 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 a come to Jesus moment of that I am going to die, and that this is the Green Reaper come to take my soul away, and I'm accepting that. I am okay with that finally. And that's why he smiles in the end, is he's like, all right, this is this is fine. Um, I had some regrets in my life, but I'm not going to regret my death. Yeah. And I think it can be, and I think if we're going to talk about what what makes this story unsettling, there's an element to how the man starts to lose his mind for a couple of days. He wakes up prone. He's not sure how he got there. You know, for everyone who's gone through that experience of taking a nap when they didn't mean to and they get woken up and you're like, you're kind of like shaken that when your understanding of reality, whether you were in the middle of like this dream that felt so real or you were asleep and you're like, what day is it? Like you're, you're seriously shaken for a period of time. And it, 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 there's something to be said about when you lose connection with time in the same way that this man lost connection for a couple of days signified by the man, you know, moving at intervals through the rooms and all of a sudden he jumps three rooms, like he lost connection with time, that it, it messes with his mind. It messes with his understanding and tying to reality. And, and it's at this point when, when he starts to lose connection to reality and to time and he goes to the clerk and he's like, that man that keeps getting closer. And the clerk's like, you're crazy. There's no man there. Like that completely shatters this man's, like his tethering to reality. It reminds me of, like, uh, remember that story, La Orla, by Guy de Montpensant, where you have the guy that's just trying to detect an undetectable force, right? That's what this man's going through, is he's realizing that there's this crazy, 
noumenal form of death coming for him, almost comparable even to like the Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe, the way that death kind of comes through you and moves throughout the rooms. That's this man's epiphany. And that's what makes him finally realize the the realization of what this man could be. Yeah. Why do you think that the setting of death always seems to be revolving around motels, hotels? It seems to be a place that is not comforting because we're not at home. We're alone. And this seems to be a reoccurring theme, I feel like, in horror. And this story does a great job of giving you that that eerie feeling, um, that disembodiment of, you know, having a connection with anybody else. And I love how, you know, it, it breaks the reality of your expectations. And uh, I think that, you know, 1934, when it was released, uh, it was probably revolutionary at the time. And I definitely think that you should check it out if you, you love little horror stories. Well, to answer your question, don't you think motels, hotels are temporary in nature? that this can't be the final thing that you have to kind of like move on for. And death is permanent. <laughs> You'll be stuck at that motel hotel forever. Just make sure it's not a super eight. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, guys, thank you for spending some time for us today in my hotel where hopefully I wake up tomorrow in the same room. It would be super awkward if I didn't, but if not, my name has been Una. Thanks for spending time with us today. Peace. Peace. <laughs>